before we dive into today's message, which you can go ahead and open up your Bibles to. That's going to be in Acts chapter 10. But before we get to our message today, I would like to just go through HCC's new mask policy in light of the new guidance given about a week and a half ago or so from the CDC and then also from uh, the Michigan Health Department. And so a statement was sent out on a Thursday in regards to our new policy here at HCC with masks. And it reads as such, Vaccinated members and attendees are no longer required to wear masks at HCC events. It is, though, highly recommended that non-vaccinated members and attendees continue to wear masks at HCC. It is also strongly encouraged that we continue to practice social distancing and other preventative measures at this time. And then the last section there reads as as such. It says, while this is a sensitive matter, we ask that everybody respect each other's personal decision. And we must continue to be united under the Lordship of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. With that being said, let's now go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We want to thank you so much for all that you have done for us, all of the blessings that you have given to us, Lord. We want to thank you for this church family here, for the fellowship and for the friendships that we have and how you have been working in the midst of our congregation, of our church here, to sanctify us and to Uh, have us become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day that you have given us, this opportunity to gather, to sing praises unto your name, which glorify your Son as Lord and Savior. And Dear Heavenly Father, I ask for a blessing now as we take a look at your Word and as we continue to study Uh, the very historic events that took place in this chapter here of the Gospel heading out and reaching the Gentiles, Lord. And I ask that You would challenge us in causing us to be pushed out of our comfort zones and taking steps of faith and sharing the good news about Your immense love that was perfectly demonstrated through Your Son, Jesus Christ, when He came some 2,000 years ago, to die on the cross for our sins, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we ultimately come before You and we want to thank You for Your Son. We want to thank You for His life, His death, His resurrection. We're looking forward to His return. We just come before You now. We just pray this prayer in Your Son's powerful name. And Jesus Christ, amen. All right, Acts chapter 10, we are going to pick up in our study of Cornelius and Peter's ministry to the Gentiles. So Acts chapter 10. By the time of the New Testament, one could easily say that's the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are non-Jews. Their particular relationship was less than ideal. At that time, the Jews viewed the Gentiles with great scorn and animosity. This attitude actually stems back to Israel's history as seen in the Old Testament. If we were to go back to the book of Leviticus, we would see there Israel, that is the Jewish people, they were called by God to be holy Because God is holy. So just how God is completely other, just how God is totally separate from sin, they too, as God's chosen people, they were called to be God's ambassadors, His representatives in the world by reflecting His holiness, by living lives that were completely other that were separate from sin. This privileged status, however, did not last very long. While 
there were moments when Israel was more faithful to this divine call. A survey of the Old Testament of Israel's history quickly reveals that they were more often unholy than they were holy. And upon closer examination, one sees that Israel rather continually and easily succumbed to the sinful practices of their pagan neighbors, that is, the Gentile nations and people groups that surrounded them. And God Himself, He actually warned Joshua just prior to Israel's entrance into the Promised Land of this temptation that the Israelites, that the Jewish people would face once they took possession of that land. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16, God forewarned and He told Joshua, He said this, This people will rise and whore after foreign gods among them in the lands that they are entering. And they will forsake Me and break My covenants that I have made with them. So, by the time of the New Testament, Israel, instead of taking responsibility for their own faithlessness, one could say that Israel, quote-unquote, wised up, but they did so in an unbiblical and in an unloving way. In an attempt to protect their holy status as God's chosen people. In an attempt to protect themselves from falling prey to the Gentile nations, their evil, their, their evil pagan practices. In an attempt to protect themselves from being spiritually contaminated. We see that the Jewish people They added additional laws to the Old Testament laws, which severely restricted their interaction with the Gentiles. In fact, whenever the Jewish people, whenever they would have any contact with the Gentiles, afterwards they would be certain to purify or ceremonially clean themselves. For example... The Jewish people, they absolutely refused to eat or have a drink with any Gentile. And any cooking utensils that was purchased from the Gentiles, they needed to be purified before being put to use. In fact, the restrictions, you could say even the hatred that the Jews had for Gentiles, was depicted in the fact that whenever the Jewish people were traveling about that particular area of the world, after traveling through a Gentile land, just prior to entering back into Israel, the promised land, the Jewish people, they would stop and they would literally shake the dust off of the bottom of their sandals, making sure that there would be no unclean Gentile dirt entering into the promised land. And so in Acts chapter 10, when we take a look at this historic chapter here, we see the Apostle Peter with, and you could say armed with the Gospel of Jesus Christ, doing the unthinkable. We see Peter, a Jew, crossing that Jew-Gentile barrier. Make no mistake about it, HCC, this was a historic move. Peter, a Jew, not only was he willing to interact, but he also here in this chapter shared with the Gentiles the good news about how they too could become holy through faith in Jesus Christ. And as Peter is sharing this gospel message, this good news that was thought to be just for the Jewish people, we see God powerfully at work furthering His kingdom outside of the borders of Jerusalem, outside of the borders of Israel, and beginning to add members to the church 
from every nation, from every tribe and people and languages. HCC, we too, as Jesus' disciples, we have been commissioned by Jesus to be his witnesses, not just here in Highland, and not just in the state of Michigan, and not just here in our country, but to the ends of the world. And so as we go, and being faithful to this divine mandate that has been placed upon us, we are going to find ourselves crossing all sorts of cultural, of societal, and ethnic barriers. In this passage that we're about to take a look at, in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 24 and running through the end of the chapter, we are going to see Peter crossing this particular ethnic barrier in three steps. And so this morning, we, as we examine each one of these steps here, we are going to see how we too ought to follow in Peter's, footstri- in, in Peter's footprints as we tell others who are unlike us about Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at the first step. The first step is found in verses 23 through 26. Now before we actually even get to this passage here, I do want to just do a quick recap of what we talked about last week and the previous passage in verses 17 through 23. Peter is seen being summoned from Joppa. This was a city on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. We see him being summoned from Joppa to Caesarea. Caesarea was a town about 30, 35 miles north, once again, on the coast. And he was summoned there in order to meet a Gentile, a Roman centurion, somebody who had a little bit of authority. And this particular particular Gentile, his name was Cornelius. So verse 25, as we take a look today at our passage here. In verse 25, it indicates that upon Peter's arrival in Caesarea, Cornelius, before Peter even got to his home, Cornelius was so excited to meet Peter that he ran out and that he met him. And going out and in meeting Peter, the text says there that Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet and worshipped him. This particular physical gesture, with this gesture here, Cornelius, he expressed his assumption that there was something, there had to have been something superior about Peter that enhanced his human nature, making him a supernatural human. You could say even a superhero who is worthy of mankind's praise and honor. And so we see Cornelius with this assumption going out to Peter, falling down and worshiping him. Take a look at verse number 26, though. In verse 26, we see Peter quickly correcting Cornelius. Verse 26 says, But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a a man. With this command, Peter not only provided a correction, but I would say, even more importantly, he made a personal connection with Cornelius. With this command, Cornelius, stand up. Peter, a Jew, was communicating to Cornelius, a Gentile, that he was just like him. There was nothing different about him when it came to his nature as a human being. They were both, according to the Scriptures, image bearers of God. They both had the capabilities given to them by God of reflecting God's holiness out into the world. However, each one of those men there, their ability to reflect God's holy nature the, the image that God has given them of being image bearers has been distorted by sin. And Peter here is also communicating that he too, just like Cornelius, was a sinner in need of a Savior. Needed a Redeemer to be put back 
together to be restored. HGC, as we seek to tell others who are unlike us about Jesus, the first step we must make in crossing that barrier is making a connection with them. Now, oftentimes we assume that we need to have something in common with that other person in order to be effective witnesses of Jesus Christ, right? We see this oftentimes in churches. To give just a few examples here. You often don't see an older youth pastor, right? The youth pastor is often younger because he can relate more easily to the kids, correct? You guys know what I'm saying? You even see this when it comes to individuals' hobbies. You see a Christian who is, I'm just going to use this term generally, no, I hope nobody takes offense here. You see a Christian who is a computer nerd, right? And he more easily would probably be able to relate to and be an effective witness with somebody who is also into computers. Same thing with somebody who is into sports, who is a jock. A Christian who is a jock. Be able more easily, we think, interact and effectively witness, share the gospel with somebody who else is into sports, who is not a believer. We even do this when it comes to ethnicity, don't we? We often think that, man, if there's a black Christian, that that individual right there is going to be more effective witnessing to the black community. Or if there is an individual who is white and lives in a rural setting, that individual is going to be more effective in a similar setting and being an effective minister of Jesus Christ, right? HGC, while shared commonalities may be useful, the Bible tells us that they are not necessary at all. The Bible tells us that they are not necessary at all. Consider Peter and Cornelius. Those are two different people. They came out of two different worlds, so to speak. You had one individual who was a Gentile. You had another individual who was a Jew. They did not interact at all. And then take a look and just consider their professions as well. Cornelius, he was a centurion. He was a Roman officer. He had a little bit of authority, right? And what was Peter? He was a fisherman, right? Not much authority there. And what do we see going on here in this passage? We see Peter making a connection with Cornelius. The one thing that we all have in common with everyone else is that we too are all human beings. All of us here, we are God's image bearers. We all have God-given strengths, and we also have sinful weaknesses in our lives. We are God's image bearers whose ability to reflect God's holiness has been distorted by sin. We all need a Redeemer to restore us. We need a Savior to save us. And so as we go, we need to keep that in the front of our minds right here. Is that we have one thing that is in common with everyone else, and that is our frail hum hu humanity. So as we go, we cannot go with an air of superiority. You don't see Peter showing up in Caesarea and Cornelius falling at his feet and Peter saying, that's right, I'm the man. That's not what Peter says. That's not what Peter did. Peter went in humility, keenly aware of his frail humanity. As we go HCC, we too, we need to go in a sense of humility. We're recognizing that there's really, truly, in our own nature, nothing special about us. That we're sinners just like everybody else. We've got a Savior, though, that we need to tell the rest of the world about. Amen? Let's take a look at the second step. The second step is found in verses 27 all the way through verse 43. 
after Cornelius stood up and Peter entered his full house. I find that to be interesting too. Just a little side note here. Cornelius, in the meantime, there was a four-day delay. Cornelius gathered all of his family members together, all of his buddies, packed them into his house. So after Cornelius stood up and Peter entered his full house, they communicated to each other the unique situation that they both found themselves in. Verses 28-29, Peter related the predicament that he faced as a Jew. And then in verses 30-32, through 32, Cornelius related the angelic pronouncements that he received four days earlier, which summoned Peter to his house in Caesarea. But then take a look at the end of verse 33. In the end of verse 33, we see Cornelius getting to the point by inviting, and I would say probably more came along the lines of an, inst- of an instruction. Remember, he was a Roman officer. He was used to giving out orders. So I can see Cornelius instructing Peter to communicate the message that God had given Peter to share with him. Verse 33, Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. And then in verses 34 through 43, we see Peter diving into the message. We see Peter communicating the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ to Cornelius and his guests. Now, as we go through this passage here, we would see that there's really nothing truly extravagant about Peter's gospel presentation. It was actually a pretty straightforward message that highlighted key points of Jesus' life and ministry. Peter began in verses 37 through the first part of verse 39 by talking about Jesus' spirit-empowered ministry, which he was able to overcome the works of the devil. We see Peter continue his message in the second part of verse 39, just quickly referring to Jesus' execution on a wooden cross. And then in verses 40 through 42, Peter, his message culminated by emphasizing Jesus' convincing resurrection from the dead, as well as his God-ordained return to carry out God's justice on the world and in the world, upon the living and the dead. And then Peter concluded his message in verse 43 with some personal application by telling Cornelius that he too can avoid God's righteous judgment in the end. That he too can attain peace with God. That he too can have his sins forgiven by simply believing the message. By simply believing this message and living his life in light of the truth that was communicated through it. We take a look at this passage right here. We take a look at Peter's sermon. It's pretty straightforward. There's nothing really too complex about it. However, Peter, he communicated the message. And that's the second step. As we go, HEC, to tell others once again who are drastically unlike us or even a little bit unlike us about Jesus, the second step we must absolutely take in crossing that barrier is by literally communicating to them the good news about Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and His promised return. Unfortunately, there are many people today who take that first step, but then they don't take that second step. They make that connection point by either serving them or perhaps by even cultivating a relationship with them. But then they fail to get the message across. They fail to literally tell that person they've made a connection with about Jesus, who He is, and what God did through Him. 
HGC, I do want to say that making connections can definitely be pivotal in our evangelistic efforts. We actually, though, need to be keenly aware and we need to make sure that we tell people about Jesus Christ. If we go and if we fail to tell, the, tell other people about Jesus, we are actually no different than the Peace Corps. We're actually no different than any other humanitarian aid. So my question to you is this. Are you able to communicate the Gospel? Are you able to tell somebody about who Jesus Christ is? Are you able to tell that person about how God, out of His immense love, has sent to Jesus Christ to die on the cross to provide forgiveness of those individuals who place their faith, their trust, and live in submission to His authority? Transforming them from a child of wrath into a child of God, welcoming, welcoming them into His family of forever. HCC, if you struggle in communicating the Gospel, if you struggle in making this second step, my suggestion to you is to get into the Word. Continue to study the Bible. The better you understand the Bible, the more effective and efficient you will be in making this second step in communicating the message. Also, don't get overwhelmed with all of the details, all of the ins and outs of theology here. Peter, he preached a pretty straightforward gospel message. And as we'll see, God used that simple gospel presentation in a very powerful way. We need to be also aware of the fact that the Bible is extremely powerful. It is extremely effective. The very beginning of Romans, Romans chapter 1. I love what the Apostle Paul says. He says in Romans chapter 1, verses, verse 16 and 17, he says this, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, that's the Gentile. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So first step is make a connection. The second step that we absolutely need to do is we need to communicate the mes a message. The third and final step for us today that we see here in Acts chapter 10 is to confirm the, confirm the miracle. We see that in verses 44 through 48. As Peter communicated the gospel, verse 44 states that he was suddenly interrupted by the Holy Spirit who fell on all who heard the word. So as Peter is there and as Peter is preaching, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes very powerfully upon Cornelius and those people who heard that message in his household and believed. And at that moment, Cornelius and his household, they became born again. They were saved. At that precise moment, they all experienced salvation. They went from children of wrath to children of God. Their sins had been forgiven. And just like the newborn church, as we saw earlier in Acts chapter 2, we see that the salvation of Cornelius and his household was actually confirmed by the fact that they were given the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. And as we saw back in Acts chapter 2, we see also here in this passage that speaking in tongues is not speaking some angelic mysterious language. This particular gift, it is the sudden ability to praise God and to preach the Gospel fluently in a foreign language previously unknown by the speaker. And so, so overwhelming at that particular point in time in history was the presence of the Holy Spirit in Cornelius' house that Peter and the Jewish Christians that had accompanied Peter to Caesarea, 
the text states that they were blown away by what they saw and heard. It confirmed to them that there was now no room, that there was no reason for any ethnic barrier in the church, and that Jews and Gentiles could now be both made holy by the Spirit through faith in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And so here we see there is now no more separation between Jews and the Gentiles in the early church. They are now brought together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Upon their salvation and indwelling of the, of the Spirit, Peter quickly realized the need for them to publicly confirm their own spiritual transformation. And so in obedience to the great commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see Peter commanding Cornelius and those believers of his household to be baptized, to physically demonstrate what Jesus did for them through his life, his death, his resurrection, and then also through this spiritual rite of, or this physical rite of baptism, to publicly pledge their allegiance to Jesus. And so, HCC, here is the third step. As we go, and as we seek to tell others who are unlike us about Jesus, the third step that we too must take in crossing barriers is confirming the gospel miracle among them. The Bible states that salvation is indeed the greatest miracle that can happen in any person's life. The moment when they go from it being an enemy of God to being welcomed into his family, to seeing the truth about just exactly who Jesus is, that he is indeed the Son of God who died on the cross as the Savior and who now has been powerfully resurrected and reigns over all of creation as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As we go and if we are privileged with that opportunity to see somebody who is unlike us after we, after we connect with them, after we preach the Gospel to them, if we see that miracle take place in their life, we are not off the hook quite yet. We're not to go out and to seek people's salvation and then turn around and run away. We have actually a responsibility to cultivate within their life the sanctification process that has just become, that, that has just begun. And so HCC, we are not to save them and then leave them, but we are actually to be with them and to finish out the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has instructed and had commanded him. And that is what we see Peter doing. The very end of verse 48, it says there that Cornelius and those other Christians, Gentile Christians in Caesarea, they asked him, that's Peter, to remain for some days. And so this is where God wanted Peter to be. As Peter stepped out of his comfort zone, as he, take that, as he took that bold step of faith and traveled to Caesarea, he found himself on the other side of that great barrier with Gentile dirt on the bottom of his feet. And God used that step of faith in a very powerful way to further the borders of his kingdom and to add members to his family. HCC, as we go, we need to go and we need to recognize that we'll be stepping outside of our comfort zones. That we will be crossing some type of barrier, whether it is cultural, societal, ethnic, you know, some ethnic barrier. We're going to find ourselves with Gentile dirt in the bottom of our feet. But let it be known that is exactly where God wants us to be. This past week, we had our first softball game. 
It went very well, as Pastor Brett announced earlier. We're 2-0 and on the season. Very, very excited about that. Um, I want to say that we, we played the same team twice. The first game, and this was our own fault. We'll, we, we sh- we'll take responsibility for this. We didn't know the rules exactly, so we had a little bit of a hard time you know, figuring it out. And I want to say that the other team was a little frustrated with us, but we got that all sorted out. And one of the things that I thought was really cool is was by the end of that second game, you could tell that there was already a little bit of connection between our team and the other team, who let's just say was a little unlike us, okay? And what I thought was very, very cool is, was at the end, Pastor Brett gathered all of us around and the other team joined us, as a matter of fact, for a closing prayer. HCC, we're just starting to plant seeds here. And we're going to get a little dirty. We're going to find some Gentile dirt on the bottom of our feet. But this is exactly where God wants us to be. So I ask you that you continue to pray for us for the rest of this season. Because we're going to be going up against some other teams, like I announced last week, who are unlike us. I think we pay, play Cushalicious, or I don't know how to say that, this next week. And so, HCC... I pray that you would, I ask that you would pray for us and that God would be working powerfully in and through our softball team this season. Not just to make a connection, but that we would actually have an opportunity to maybe pull somebody aside and to share with them the good news about Jesus Christ. And perhaps then to maybe even remain committed to them after the season ends. And continue to invest in their lives with the hopes that they become a Christian. They are welcomed into the family of God just like the rest of us, saved sinners. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We want to thank you so much for this day that you have given us. I just ask that you would...